On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to this episode of Life Science Success. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don. I'm a consultant in life sciences. I help life science companies establish their people, process, and technology in alignment with their strategy. As you can see at the bottom of this page, there's a link down there for a weekly series that I've been holding called the Scaling Me Method Thoughts at Scale. And in those sessions, we actually uh, cover key topics that organizations are dealing with. And one of the the key topics right now that is pretty commonly dealt with across a lot of different organizations is fractional leadership. And so having a fractional executive inside of your company or any other form of part-time senior leadership inside of your company is something that we're going to talk about this week. And um, we're covering a lot, of, a lot of other key topics as well. So with that, let me bring in our guest in this episode of Life Science Success. My guest is Todd Drewley. Dr. Drewley is the Chief Medical Officer at Mission Bio. His expertise lies in translational genomic and computational tools to improve clinical diagnostics and apply these tools to disease-specific questions in cancer. So with that, thanks for joining me, Todd. Hey, good to see you, Don. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. And, um, you know, after having uh, having worked with you in the past, it's uh, it's great to see you again. And um, you know, would love for people to get to hear a little bit more about you. Um, so can you share a little bit of, about the key moments in your career and what kind of led you to want to do this, uh, you know, in in your career? Sure. Yeah, I, um, you know, I was doing um, research for my PhD. I was doing research in cancer in Chicago and uh, really just seeing it from a, a disease biology perspective. But at the same time, my cousin had a three-year-old son who got AML, uh, myeloid leukemia, and he was at Riley's Ch Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. So I drove down from Chicago a few times to visit them. And, and unfortunately, he passed away while waiting for a bone marrow transplant. And, you know, knowing that I was going into uh, medicine, uh, you know, I had a I really saw this intersection of what I was studying in research and the personal connection as a way forward for my own career. And so that, that was a pretty seminal moment. Um, that research then was at the very beginning of the genomics era. You know, we didn't even know what genomics really meant at the time, but it sounded like it was the way of the future. One of the places that was really leading the way in the Human Genome Project was Washington University in St. Louis along with the Broad Institute and Baylor. So, you know, I grew up in Illinois. Uh, my wife at the time was from uh, Indiana. We were planning a family. So being in St. Louis sounded pretty close and, and was a great opportunity for me there. And, you know, I, I ended up taking a slightly different track as far as my postdoctoral research. I decided I wanted to work with a bioengineer and he was new faculty uh, who was a co-inventor of next generation sequencing, Rob Mitra. And so, you know, my chairman kind of looked at me and said, you aren't an engineer and you don't know computational biology. He's an engineer who doesn't know medicine. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, this is a fair question, but I, I turned to him and I said, well, you know, I see it this way. He knows how to build a better mousetrap, but I'm the guy who knows where to find the mice. So let's see if we can put something together here and uh, get some progress going. And so that was a great, great for me. I really got to learn uh, genomics from an engineering point of view and data quality and data uh, science. And so, uh, you know, the, the adults at the time were just sequencing the first human cancer genome in a 40 year old woman with AML. And so it, it gave me an opportunity to be the link as a pediatric oncologist, I could be the liaison between our genomics enterprise and the pediatric subspecialist, which I did for uh, about 15 years before I left to go into industry as a chief medical officer at Archer DX in 2019, which is where we met each other. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what, I mean, in terms of like making that transition though, between academics and in industry, um, what made you decide that you wanted to work with, you know, work with companies that were actually, you know, out in the space versus the, you know, continuing down the research path? Yeah, that's, to be honest, not something I ever expected that I'd be doing. Uh, you know, I thought I'd be in academic medicine my entire career, but I could see that uh, there was going to be a limit to the impact that I could make as a solo researcher in the Midwest, to be quite frank. And, you know, I, I knew the team at Archer. We used a lot of Archer products in my research. And so I had done some speaking for them. I knew the leadership. I, I knew the products. I knew, you know, what they were good for and the potential for what they could do. So I wasn't really angling for anything different, but the CEO of Archer at the time contacted me and said they were looking for a chief medical officer. And would I please give that some consideration? And, you know, it really at the time seemed like an exciting new opportunity for me to do something different and potentially have a, a broader impact through a business route. So I learned a lot of new things and I really enjoyed it. And, and I was very glad that I did that. Yeah, I mean, I did, um, for anybody that that doesn't know, the Archer, G, Archer DX was um, not only somebody who had um, you know, products that had, you know, they had several LDTs that, uh, you know, you could bring into your lab. But in addition to that, um, we're working on NGS diagnostics as well. Um, that would be, you know, lab qualified as well. So, yeah. Um, in terms of the, the evolution that you've seen though, I mean, I feel like, I, I don't know if you get the sense that I do, but I feel almost like we are almost at a perfect place and perfect time in terms of what we're able to see and detect and things like that. I mean, I know that there's still a lot of work to be done, but having seen this evolution yourself, where do you feel like, you know, the most significant pivot points have, have kind of come in uh, to, to the diagnostic space? Yeah, I remember early on in the NGS era, people saying, you know, this will never be used as a clinical tool. Uh, it was expensive and clumsy and the data analysis was slow and, and costly and time consuming. And those things got mitigated. And, 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 and so, you know, being able to bring sequencing into diagnostics, I think, has opened tremendous possibilities. Uh, you know, not just for cancer, but for all kinds of diseases uh, all around the world. And it's really, I think, provided opportunities for un historically underprivileged communities to receive more advanced treatments as well, which is certainly important. Um, you know, I can say for myself, you know, I, the reason I'm at Mission Bio now is, is to me, I think the next step in the evolution of diagnostics, and that's moving from what we call a bulk sequencing analysis, where every cell is analyzed in one batch. So you just burst them open, you take all the DNA and, you know, you, you, it's all amalgamated and, and you try to do some fancy computational gymnastics to infer what's going on. And, you know, it's probably pretty accurate you know, to some percentage uh, of the sample. But as we get into the era of more personalized medicines, you know, the, the, this technology is enabling precision therapies to be created at a, at a really qu quick rate. Uh, so we're hearing more and more oncologists who say, you know, I have so many options at my disposal that I need technology that not only tells me the patient has a problem, but couples a potential therapeutic choice with that. And so to me, it's going to be hard to do that when you're doing a bulk measurement. And I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about the opportunity for single cell multi-omics to provide that type of insight to physicians. Which, you know, is a very close tie then to your move to Mission Bio, given, given their focus. Um, can you explain in, in more layman's terms, what is single cell multi-omics? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, with with this platform, we're able to take 100,000 cells from any cancer, uh, blood sample, bone marrow sample, put it in the machine. And so each cell gets analyzed individually. 
So you're going to measure, you know, dozens or hundreds of DNA targets and, and surface proteins on each cell separately. So instead of having one giant sample where you just average everything, you've taken 100,000 cells and you've squashed them up into one readout for DNA or for protein and just kind of guessing at, you know, what, what mutations go with what other mutations and go with what proteins. Now you can actually say, I've got 2,767 cells that have this exact genetic and protein profile and and this group of cells could be resistant to the treatment that this patient's receiving and cause bigger problems down the road. And, and so that's, that's the potential, I think, for single cell multi-omics because we're doing DNA and protein at the same time. Uh, so, you know, that it's still not 100% proven, but I think a lot of people feel like that is the future. And then is there a direct link then between what Mission Bio is doing and pediatric oncology then on the back end? Well, you know, I think as a, I, I'm a pediatric oncologist and I've always been, you know, disappointed to some degree at how far behind pediatric cancer is in terms of treatment compared to other cancers. You know, a lot of these kids are receiving agents that were developed in the 1970s. And part of that is because luckily pediatric cancer in general is a pretty rare condition. And so, it, you know, it's just not cost effective for a major drug company to develop a, a therapy specifically for a child. So rather than just saying you have leukemia, we can use these types of technology to say your leukemia has these two, three, four different specific traits. And here are two or three treatment options that are designed specifically for those traits, whether it's designed for an adult or a child or a lung cancer or blood cancer. You know, these are the genetic lesions that uh, tend to respond to these specific treatments. So the, the hope is always that, you know, the, ch the children will benefit more from the newest, latest, greatest precision therapies if you have diagnostics that tell them precisely what agents to use. You know, all the precision therapies in the world are only as good as the tools used to match the treatment to the patient. Oh, very good. And that, and that again, I, I feel like, again, ties to the next question that I had is that as a chief medical officer, then how do you bridge that gap between like technical advancements and what you guys are doing at Mission Bio and the or and the treatments on the other side? Yeah, it's a two pronged attack. I you know I think whether it was Archer and now Mission Bio, there's been that early on there's always support for the translational researchers doing disease based research at academic centers. And these are the folks that are typically driving the field forward and, and lending credibility to any particular scientific platform or school of thought. So you work with them, but as the technology matures, because they say this is working, this isn't working, here's what we need, here's what we'd like to have. Uh, and then you build that and then, you, you know, hopefully you have something that you can say, wow, if, if somebody used this to identify why this patient failed their treatment and what, what would be the next treatment of choice for that particular patient, that would be really exciting. So you have to work with both the oncologists and the pathologists because the pathologists are actually doing the work in the molecular laboratory and generating a report that then goes to the oncologist who's going to decide what treatment to uh, provide to that patient. So, you know, it's a dynamic discussion between pathologists, oncologists, research and development at the company and the medical affairs team on how do we support the people that are really driving the technology forward in a clinically meaningful way. Um, but also, you know, we're generating data and building something that's going to be commercially advantageous for the company and also pass regulatory muster. So, you know, I always see the CMO and the medical affairs team sort of sitting in the middle of a big Venn diagram, supporting a lot of different components of, of any given company. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's and it's not, it doesn't come without its complexities either, right? I always feel like um, there's any level of uh, complexities that come in, you know, whether you're talking about the diagnostic or you're talking about the treatment side. 
Um, and now you're talking about, you know, how do you combine both, right, for that personalized approach? And um, so, so I'm, I'm assuming that there's just an awful lot of, you know, overall challenges in terms of managing that Venn diagram as well. Yeah, there's tremendous challenges, uh, you know, so we're in a down economy. And so, you know, just financially, that's very challenging, not just for us, but for the entire space. Grant funding, you know, it is has become more scarce, mostly through philanthropies who no longer can provide the same grant support because people aren't donating. So there's less money available, costs have gone up. So even if you get the money, you can, can't do as much work as you could two, three years ago. Uh, and then, you know, that you have to be incredibly particular on which samples you analyze and how you analyze them in order to generate a data set that's going to be convincing to a broader audience. So th there's very real challenges and that makes progress slow. Um, so you have to be very strategic on who, what, when, where, and how uh, things get done and deployed and, and what, you know, what you're bringing to the equation to, to push the company and the field forward. And how are you guys, how are you guys doing that level of selection, at least at mission, um, you know, today, how does that come into, um, into play? Yeah, that's an ongoing discussion that we have almost every day, I think, is, is who are we going to support and how are we going to support them? What can we do uh, that makes sense for business, but also, um, you know, makes sense for our very loyal and, and enthusiastic customers. So, you know, we have early access programs that we, you know, have a potential clinical tool. So we deploy this at just a, a handful of very select labs and institutions, not all in one location. We want to have diversity in, in who's running it and under what uh, context they're running it, what data are they generating, what's working, what's not working. So, you know, through that type of a program, there's incentives to get the data quickly, um, to share the data with us so that we can, you know, use it for marketing purposes and, and also for R&D to build the next iteration of whatever that protocol requires. And so that's an, a very dynamic discussion. And, you know, we bring a lot of people to bear in those discussions to make sure everyone agrees and everyone um, understands, you know, that what are the time scales involved? What are the costs involved? And, and you know, what if we if, if all of this happens according to what we're outlining, what's going to be the upside on the on the back end of this? So that those are uh, important discussions. Yeah, very important. And then how do you manage or how do you navigate the regulatory requirements that that you face as well in terms of um, doing this? And how does your team uh, then work to bring innovative solutions to market? Yeah, so that's a that's an also a very critical component of the job is dealing with regulatory. So, um, you know, and things have changed. That's a, it, just as dynamic as any other discussion because the the re, what is required to pass regulatory muster is an ever evolving um, uh, set of hurdles. I think, you know, when we were at Archer, we could still do uh, in not LDTs or sort of non regulated products in Europe. You can't do that anymore. IVDR means everything has to be approved by the European Commission which is a higher burden of proof. Um, you know, the FDA has made some insinuations that they may do something similar in the United States. We'll see if that comes to bear. Uh, so, you know, that this means that anything you create that's going to be used for clinical purposes, the data has to be generated in a very highly regulated way, in a cap CLIA facility with certain thresholds and safeguards. Uh, you know, and, and you have to have enough samples to have certain statistical outcomes. And we want to work both with, you know, who ideally we're going to go to the regulatory agency, hopefully with a pharma partner, because we've shown that our assay is particularly useful in identifying patients who've received a particular treatment or a clinical protocol. And so that might be the pharma partner, that might be a clinical institution who's done an investigator initiated trial, trying a new combination of various agents. Um, so, you know, 
right now we don't have any plans to go to the FDA as a standalone device just to say, hey, we're really good for you know cancer X. We we are trying to have very targeted strategic goals where we have partners going with us and and you know hopefully get approval for a very specific indication yeah and it, i mean it sounds to me too like if the fda does go, does go that direction in terms of you know having limits in terms of lab developed tests or more stringent you know sort of controls around lab developed tests um it it will become a different uh, challenge in terms of producing some of the data that they need to be able to create a, a you know, a final diagnostic anyway. Cause I mean, at least for most of the organizations I've worked with, right, there's a benefit in having these and that you're continually, you know, getting more and more data in terms of how your diagnostic works <laughs> and, you know, where there might be limitations, you know, on the, in the periphery as well. And so, um, yeah, I would hope that some of this gets brought into consideration as well, because it'll just become more of a more of a challenge with regards to then developing a diagnostic. It'll almost become, um, yeah, you, you'll just have to have a lot more controlled studies, I guess, to be able to produce the data that you need in the end. Yeah, I agree completely. It's going to get slower. It's going to get, and I understand, you know, the FDA has, has seen an onslaught. We're talking about how the genomics era has evolved rapidly. And now we have multiomics, proteomics, um, you know, transcriptomics, all these different things. This is huge data sets across, you know, large sample sizes. So I, I understand it's very difficult for the FDA to keep up and, and, you know, this is, I think this is what happened in Europe. Every country sort of had their one or two flavors for every kind of test. And it was just kind of a free for all. And so they tried to tighten that up with the IVDR regulations. And maybe there's some similarities there, but I think if we just get rid of LDTs altogether, as you say, it's going to become a, an enormous mountain to climb to get anything across <laughs> the finish line. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, in some cases, they're asking for, I don't know, just a, a mountain of data, you know, as well for the FDA. And I mean, one way to produce that is, you know, get get people to enroll as a part of, you know, using the LDT. Right. So, yeah. 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 so um, yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, just to focus on you a little bit, you transition between academia and then now companies and now leading clinical effort, efforts at Mission Bio. Um, what leadership principles have guided you th throughout, you know, each one of these transitions from in the various roles you've had? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think I, I was pretty nervous when I made the leap. You know, as I mentioned, I never saw myself leaving academia. So, you know, that was a system that I knew very well and I felt comfortable in. And then to go into industry, I remember, you know, one of my early days at Archer DX, I asked the CEO, my new boss, you know, so just what does the CMO do? And he said, I don't know. That's why I hired you. <laughs> <laughs> so you just had to dive in and, and figure it out. And so, you know, talk to a lot of other CMOs at, at various levels, various stages of companies, um, participated in those discussions and really just gone out and, and talked to people. So I think, you know, what my management style, what works for me is to let people do what they're good at and what, you know, whether they work next to me or, you know, sort of in, in my organization, you know, enable people to do what they're successful uh, at doing. That's why you hired them in the first place. So, um, you know, so, and I've also tried to build my medical affairs teams, um, you know, to actually be the tip of the spear in many cases. Historically, I think medical affairs has often followed commercial. And so commercial would be out there. And if they, the sales team ran into somebody who said, hey, is this particular tool or drug good for patients that have this problem? You know, you call a timeout and you get the medical affairs team in there and, and you know, they would have a non-commission based analysis to say yes or no, this is going to work or it's not going to work, um, you know, which is great. And I think that's that should always be a function of the medical affairs team. But, you know, medical affairs often has different contacts in that realm of pathologists and oncologists 
and so can make different inroads than the sales team. And I think, you know, you see progress faster if you have two prongs of attack. You've got two teams working in parallel for lead generation. And in my experience, I've found that to be very productive. You know, and, and those are the cases where the dynamic is flipped. Medical affairs identifies an opportunity. It's maybe it's at a scientific conference, a medical conference, or through connections at a particular institution, what have you. And inevitably, question is this sounds great to me. What, you know, how much does this cost? And then we call a timeout and we bring in the commercial <laughs> team and say, you know, hey, you have a potential customer here. Can you please outline what they're looking at? So, you know, having those two groups working in parallel has been uh, pretty successful when they're fully enabled to do what they're good at. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I've seen from you as well. I mean, I, you definitely uh, walk that walk quite frequently in terms of letting people, um, you know, sort of run on their own, but also, you know, making sure that you're there to support them, you know, as well. It's certainly what I, what I saw in the, in the past from you. Can you share a time whenever a failure or setback has led to significant learning or improvement in your career? Yeah, boy, going through academia, it's 80% failure. You know, grants <laughs> don't get funded, experiments don't work, uh, patients don't fare well. Um, so that's, you know, that's a very consistent uh, reminder of, of failure. And, and so, you know, you, you have to expect that in this arena and you can't be afraid of failure. You've got to expect it and, and grasp it and, and try to learn from it. Um, I think, you know, in the industry side, <coughs> excuse me, I've seen, you know, where I think, again, I have experienced my own success and I think provided success for others when we let, um, you know, the, the the people that we hire to do a particular job, we, we enable them to do that job at a high level. And I've seen failure when that is restricted and we have leadership that for whatever reason, doesn't give um, full authority or enablement to those groups to actually do what they've been hired to do. And of course, things don't get done at, at that level yeah. and, and the whole organization then suffers because of that. So, you know, so that's, you know, the teams that I'm on, I'm always pushing to say, you know, you hired all of us here for a reason. So please let us do our jobs. Yeah, that's, that's so true. So there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? You know, I get really inspired when I'm out on the road. Uh, I spend a lot of time traveling, going to conferences and institutions. And when I run into uh, somebody who's really excited about how you know, our particular platform could be used in the future for a specific scientific question or a clinical trial or, you know, some, you know, clinical question, you know, just seeing that enthusiasm and then kicking ideas back and forth with somebody and, and you know, hey, this will work, this might not work, maybe more of this, less of that, you know, that's really exciting to me. I, I that's what you know really makes the job fun for me is getting out and, and just hearing people's enthusiasm. We had an event on Monday in Boston and we had three great young uh, new PIs presenting exciting data and we had a pretty young audience. And so just to see these postdocs and you know kind of big eyes and asking questions and hey, what if you did this or what if you did that and just you know, I, it, it, it's, it's inspiring when people are excited to kind of question things and, and push things forward. I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, absolutely. What concerns you? Well, we've hit on a few of them. You know, I'm concerned about the regulatory environment. I, you, know, you know, how do we, you know, of course we want patients to be safe and treated safely. That goes without question. Um, but, you know, can we do that in a way that doesn't stifle innovation in clinical care? And, you know, the, the, this regulatory environment seems to me to be the big linchpin between those two things. And so I, I, I do worry about that. Uh, the economy is going to turn around. There's always ups, there's always downs. So you weather the storm and you move on. I'm less worried about that. But, you know, I do, I do want to see continued innovation in clinical care. And so you know, uh, hopefully that won't get stifled as, as things change. Yeah, I feel like there are so many great things that could, 
that could come if we if we could prevent innovation from being stifled without also sacrificing patient safety or you know some sort of um, challenge from a you know clinical outcome standpoint because of you know what we're trying to innovate right we the, you're, you're not trying to sacrifice one for the other um, and and in that if if there I guess if there's you know, true justification in terms of changing the regulatory environment. Maybe there's a way to involve industry more and and come up with, um, you know, I guess regulations that that meet their standards, but also meet the regulator standards, but also, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, help to continue innovation as well. I think that's an excellent suggestion. You know, we're we're part of the NIST consortium, so the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And, you know, that's mostly for cell and gene therapies, which is also a big component of our business. But, you know, they're turning to the people developing the technology to help develop the industry standards for for a broad battery of different capabilities. And I think that's been a very successful model. And to your point, maybe that's something that should be tried at other levels of the regulatory environment. Last question. Last question for you. What excites you? Yeah, I'm always excited about the future. You know, I, I every time you think, boy, you know, we're doing a really great job. I, I remember patients that would come in and they would sit there and say, you know, it's the 21st century. How can we not do more for my my family member, my loved one? And and you you and you feel like, yeah, why can't we do more? This is ridiculous. We should be able to do more. And so. You know, it, it shows the complexity of human disease, but, it, you know, it's a, it's a pretty humbling deficiency when you're the one who's sitting there in front of the family and you have nothing to offer them. So there's a lot of room for improvement. And I'm excited about all of the companies and all of the young scientists and, and everybody who's trying to push this forward and, and fill those gaps. That, that's a lot of fun. And that's a group of people I enjoy being around. Absolutely. Well, Todd Jurley, thank you so much for being on the Life Science Success Podcast and for telling me about Mission Bio and the great work that you're doing there. And uh, I wish you all, those, all the greatest success. It was a pleasure to be with you, Don. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. (music) 